Well, my, my guess was like on the order of 85%, like enough that I could assume the concepts in the talk without explaining them, but this is like insufficiently correct. Uh, I'm going to wait uh, an extra three minutes or so for any uh, stragglers to show up. Um, if, if before then anyone has any like completely freestyle questions that they think are unlikely to be covered in this talk, feel free to hit me with them now. No one has any questions. <laughs> Either that or all the people who have questions don't have any courage. Oh, a courageous one. Could you explain the concept you just mentioned? Effective altruism. Oh, all righty. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. So, um, which is better, to provide one seeing eye dog for a blind person in a Western country at a cost of $40,000, or to take the same money and provide sufficient, I forget what the exact treatment was, but uh, apparently you can get around 100, if anyone here knows, feel free to jump in. Apparently you can uh, treat about 100 people or treat, prevent around 100 cases of blindness in um, third world countries for the same $40,000. So the question is, which of these things is better? Some people think that the answer to this is obviously like number two, why are you even asking me this question? And these people are known as effective altruists. They are distinguished by um, trying to um, like quantify how effective they're being and trying to choose the most effective cause sort of without reference to a starting point. Like they don't pick interventions against malaria and then try to do the most effective possible intervention per dollar against malaria. The idea behind effective altruism is that you look over literally everything you could possibly do, try to weigh everything you're accomplishing against each other and pick literally the maximizing action. So there's some foundations out there who will um, pick malaria and say like what is the most effective thing we can do against malaria. Effective altruism goes beyond this to cause neutrality where you aren't even supposed to be beholden to any particular cause. You're not like pick, take, picking up one particular cause and saying while well, I'm doing this with my life and other people will pick up other causes. You're actually supposed to choose between causes on the basis of how relatively effective they are and maximize the amount of good you can do with a given amount of time or money. So it's extremely controversial and very few people would espouse these ideals. Uh, the, you, you, you have uh, a fairly large effective altruist community here in Oxford and in fact they work out of the Little Gate House um, is where you will find the Center for Effective Altruism and 80,000 hours, so-called, because a typical career involves around 80,000 hours worth of effort. And the question is how to use those 80,000 hours most effectively. So this talk is one I originally gave at the Effective Altruism Summit in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, I figured enough people here would have heard of effective altruism that the talk I gave at the Effective Altruism Summit would be at least somewhat appropriate. It was a talk to effective altruists on like one particular thing that I thought was a, oh, fairly reasonable candidate for literally the most good you could possibly do with your life. I'll actually like skip these since they were like targeted specifically at. So first a sort of like Zen Cohen. Which of these events is a hundred times as bad as the other. Event one, all but 1,000 humans die. So that is about seven billion deaths because seven billion is the total world population at this time. Second, the last 1,000 humans die. Okay, who thinks that option one is worse? Who thinks that option two is worse? Why is option two worse? And, So like what is the important thing though? Is it like the important thing that sort of humanity survive regardless of how many people there are? Is that a, a hundred times as valuable as all the people alive right now? Um, survival of information. You could like sort of make a case that like maybe the survival of humanity qua survival of humanity is more important than any number of individual human lives but 
Another reply would be that in the second case, it destroys the value of all future generations. So Parfit was talking about how we can reasonably expect to have uh, many millions of years of life upon Earth. Um, this thing and how the like, world population over the course of millions of years would involve many more people than all of the people who are alive today. Of course, this vastly understates the real case to be made. After all, the Earth is just uh, one relatively tiny speck within the solar system. The majority of matter is not the matter that we are using upon the surface of the land masses of Earth. Uh, the sun weighs, trying to, I don't actually recall the exact figure off the top of my head. It's about 10 to the 33 grams, but I don't remember how that compares to Earth or the, all the matter on the surface of Earth. The point is the amount of matter and energy that can reasonably be used for life is vastly greater than the amount of matter and energy available on the surface of the Earth. The solar system, of course, is not the only star in the sky. This over here is sort of our local stellar neighborhood. Um, we aren't zooming out by a factor of 10 each time, if you're thinking that. We're actually zooming out by a whole lot more than a factor of 10 each time. Our entire neighborhood is right about over there. It's like not a large section of this uh, graph, which is why there's no little square for it. That's the galaxy. It contains about 400 billion stars. This is our local stellar, uh, inter local galactic neighborhood. Um, the Andromeda galaxy is a bit bigger than us, but apart from that, we are like sort of a, you know, like big weight to throw around. Uh, like the Milky Way is actually a pretty relatively large galaxy. But there are others larger, especially if you zoom out to the level of the local galactic group. Uh, and we should be in here. I don't think we're marked anymore, but I think we'd be over here because I think we are in the Virgo cluster. Uh, which, of course, is part of the Virgo supercluster, which is uh, right over here and is merely one of many other superclusters, if you zoom out a bit further. And uh, if you zoom out far enough, it all starts to look like a big blur of lots and lots of useful matter and energy, which could conceivably be converted into intelligent life if we survive. So my answer as to why it is worse to kill the last thousand humans is that if you kill the last thousand humans, you use that, you, you lose that. Like, in this generation, we determine, will we lose it or will we use it? And so the first like, key thesis I present to you is a thesis of astronomical stakes. The stakes are literally astronomical. And if you think about billions of years, all those stars, then this is a sort of very special moment in history when the people on one particular planet have the chance to screw all of that up. If all goes well, a billion years from now, it will not be possible for seven billion people on the surface of the, uh, on the land masses of the surface of one planet orbiting one star in just a single galaxy, it will not be possible for like those people to make decisions that affect the fate of everyone, because how fair is that? How fair is it for like a few people to be able to affect the fate of the entire universe if you know all those other people out there don't get a vote? But of course right now all those other people don't exist. We have to protect them or they'll never quite come to be. So if you happen to be one of the like very infinitesimally tiny set of all the sentient beings who ever will exist, who are actually here right now when we get to determine whether all of those other beings actually exist or not. Your most important thing you have to do is to ensure that 
all of those galaxies get converted into intelligent life with a high standard of living. Um, oh, the, the qualities, those are quality adjusted life years. They're the basic unit of currency in effective altruism. Whether you're considering um, intervening against malaria um, uh, or trying to like ensure that people get enough vitamin A to, to have vision. The uh, question is like, how many quality adjusted years of life do you gain? If you're like, life is twice as better as it would have been otherwise and you live for 80 years, that's 40 quality adjusted life years. So there was once a uh, bank robber who was asked, why do you rob banks? And he replied, because that's where the money is. So. Why care about the galaxies? Because that's where the quality adjusted life years are. Most of the quality adjusted life years that will ever exist are not here upon the surface of Earth in the present day. They are located in the future after the universe has been converted into intelligent life. Second key idea, like, okay, how do you affect the far future? So in 1965, um, uh, a fellow by the name of uh, Irving J. Good, who uh, worked with Turing, Alan Turing at Bletchley Park and on uh, code breaking and later went on to be one of the uh, founders of the modern form of Bayesian statistics um, and is known today for the uh, Good Turing estimator, uh, said, let an ultra-intelligent machine be defined as a machine that can far surpass all the intellectual activities of any man, however clever. Since the design of machines is one of these intellectual activities, an ultra-intelligent machine could design even better machines, there would then unquestionably be an intelligence explosion, and the intelligence of man would be left far behind. So that unquestionably part, that was a bit optimistic. A whole lot of people have questioned things since then. Big surprise, right? You wouldn't expect people to question a statement like that. So um, note some things I.J. Good did not say. He did not say that we can predict when this will happen by estimating how much computing power there is in a human brain and then drawing a neat chart of Moore's law and projecting out the chart of Moore's law until the like, number crosses the number that we said was the number of computing operations performed by the human brain. That kind of thought came a bit later. Uh, if you look at the sort of like first great historical person who said that, uh, Hans Moravec, he like spent like one chapter justifying his estimate that the brain was performing the equivalent of 10 trillion operations per second. And he spent a lot of chapters convincing the reader that more, of the like shocking proposition that Moore's law could continue until we had supercomputers doing 10 trillion operations per second in 2010. It actually happened in 2008. But of course, the concept that you have some exact number of computing operations and then you get AI turned out to be completely bogus. And so the prediction as a whole failed. Um, he also isn't talking about like some kind of inevitable convergence of all technologies into one kind of giant info nano blobish thingy dingy. So this is like an isolated thesis. Like whatever you might have heard packaged under other words, such as the singularity, which we are like, I now work for the Machine Intelligence Research Institute. We called our, used to call ourselves the Singularity Institute. The word kind of meant something different at that time. It hadn't been like overloaded with, with 10,000 different meanings. But anyway, sufficiently intelligent machine can improve itself in a way which improves its ability to improve itself further. And this process can continue, not indefinitely, there are these things called the laws of physics, but it can continue far enough that by the time it halts, you have something that could justifiably be called a superintelligence. That is the intelligence explosion thesis in its modern form. Okay, why is that important? Like you have some AI and it's like super good at all that intellectual stuff. Well, you know, like so what, it hasn't gotten any money or something, right? So I find that in a lot of cases I have to clarify, like intelligence, I don't mean sort of like the things that stereotypically intelligent people, such as yourselves, do all day. Um, I mean this thing, this, the stuff that separates us, and not by very much, from our close cousins, the chimpanzees. 
Um, it's not just about calculus or chess. It's uh, um, like even if you talk about things like social persuasion or reading faces or rationality or strategic cleverness or building, figuring out how to build molecular nanotechnology or figuring out how to take over the world, then these are all like activities that are performed in the brain rather than say the kidneys. At the very least, when we're talking about what kind of intelligence an AI, an artificial intelligence can conceivably get its hands on, um, like what could we do with the brain? So some things are sort of obvious. Um, the brain is not end user modifiable. Like if something goes wrong with your brain, you cannot like slide out the broken part, get a new one, slide it back in. The um, uh, Aristotle thought that the brain was a organ for cooling the blood. And he also, I mean, like he wasn't, didn't think it had no cognitive function. He also thought that if your blood was cooled, you would be like sort of more cool tempered and more rational. But basically Aristotle thought the, the brain was an organ for cooling the blood. That is how little introspective access we humans have to the software comprising us, to the hardware comprising us. So if you were designing a mind from scratch, not evolving the thing, not like evolution burping it out, but if you, the, like if you were actually intelligently designing an intelligence, um, you would certainly give it the ability to read it, its own memory and write to it. You would let it know what its own algorithms are. Um, a for, another advantage of AI is, you know, like the very smartest humans, there is a correlation between IQ and brain size. It's not a perfect correlation. It's not even close. To, I think the like actual value is something like 0 0.4. Um, I mean, if brain si you can sort of see how that might be true, because if brain size literally did not in correlate to intelligence at all, there's no reason for us not to have squirrel-sized brains. But nonetheless, just um, the total amount that humans' brains vary in size is not very impressive compared to um, here's a thousand times as much money, give me a thousand times as much brain. So understandable code, modular des inter design, clean internal environment. The brain is a very noisy environment. If you take out the noise, some parts of the brain stop working. Or at least we think it looks that way. Like it looks to us like when we try to model algorithms in the brain that there are some algorithms that require noise and if you take out the noise, the algorithm stops working. Is this because the noise itself is performing useful cognitive work? Um, can you like extract useful cognition from a heat bath? Um, no, what's happening is that the neurons have evolved to get used to the noise. And for example, like let's say you're, you're looking at a very faint visual field, like there's not many photons coming in. You can actually be able to get a more powerful detector if the, um, by having some noise come in with that so that it's more likely that the few photons which do come in will push a neuron that also had some positive noise over the threshold for firing. So you can have effects like that. But ultimately, the reason why we don't have modern day computer chips with lots of electronic noise thrown in is that if you have the choice between having a clean environment and having a noisy environment, like systematically, for fairly basic reasons, information theory says that you're going to be able to get more work done in the less noisy environment. And precise execution, right? Like we learned how to do the like sort of gigantic wedding cake multiplication thing in uh, whatever you call grade school over here. I don't know the Britishism for it, but like when you, were, when you were very young, you learned how to perform wedding cake multiplication. But you can't just like tell your brain to do that and sort of walk away and come back a, like a few minutes later to find that it has multiplied two 100 digit numbers together. Everything you want to do with your brain, you have to do using the entire power of your brain and like the full might of your prefrontal cortex to focus in your attention and focus your execution of it. Which means that a lot of operations that we do are taking way more computing power than they should. Faster serial cognition, this one is kind of obvious. If you look at the 
Is my next slide fundamental? No, it's not. Um, if you look at, for example, an individual neuron, then um, around the, fa the fastest an ordinary neuron will fire is something on the order of 200 times per second. There are like a few neurons that fire faster than that, but they're very rare. 200 times per second, that's not much. Like, it's easy to sort of be over impressed by how parallel the brain is. The fact that there are something like a hundred trillion synapses in there. But since they're all firing only like on the order of 100 times per second, actually like maybe more like 20 times per second on average for an activated area, um, it's much less impressive than it works because imagine like trying to write a computer program that does something, only your computer processor runs at 200 hertz. Like not 200 megahertz, 200 hertz. 200 operations per second. You'd have to like use vastly parallel amounts of, of programming, po of, of computing power just to do anything at all in real time. In fact, you probably wouldn't believe that anything at all could be done in, in, in real time on a 200 hertz processor. The like sort of miracle of the brain is not how well it works, but that it works at all when it's running at 100 cycles per second, when everything you do with the brain has to complete in at most 100 serial steps one after the other. On this score, we already have um, the, the sort of biology of the brain beat pretty solidly. We can have things that do two billion things, one thing after another in one second. It's a crazy amount of power. The signals that travel along our neurons are going at around maybe 100 meters per second, um, which is around a millionth of the speed of light, a bit less. The um, uh, heat dissipation is one area where um, the brain still has a bit of an advantage over biology. Um, the uh, Although like, our, like a present computer like, dissipates more heat in the course of doing an operation than the brain does, so that our ability to cool our computers is now becoming the fundamental bottleneck to how many operations we can do on a computer chip. Nonetheless, even in the brain, which is a lot more efficient than a computer, it's dissipating something on the order of half a million times the um, like thermodynamic minimum energy you have to do to perform a binary irreversible operation at room temperature, 300 Kelvin. So in terms of physical limits, we know from the laws of physics that we can build a brain that operates one million times as fast as human brain without shrinking the brain, cooling the brain any more than it does currently, using anything along the lines of reversible computing or quantum computing. We know that it's possible to think a million times as fast. And since a year is around 31 million seconds, we know that it's possible to build machines that can do a a year's worth of subjective thinking in 31 seconds, which is what I'm showing over here. But the real like sort of big open question is what can you do by improving software? We understand the brain's software a heck of a lot less well than we understand the brain's hardware. But there's sort of no fundamental reason um, Incidentally, we are now getting into sort of like probably more controversial areas of the talk. And I would like to um, ask someone to interrupt me in the middle of this very sentence, just so that people know that interrupting me in the middle Stop. is, thanks. <laughs> Go ahead and interrupt me with questions at any time. So software is harder to analyze, but one version of the argument would be like, well, the brain's hardware is not anywhere near optimum. Why should the software be any closer to optimum? Um, you might sort of worry that maybe trying to optimize the brain's software is a process that has diminishing returns. And in areas like this, it's sort of like very easy to make up hypotheses and then it's like very hard to figure out what we're currently seeing that's telling us something about these hypotheses. So here I would um, re refer people to a little uh, publication, uh, Intelligence Explosion Microeconomics, like sort of a working paper um, that is like sort of trying to analyze these things in much greater detail. But we can see from the fossil record, 
from Australopithecus to Homo sapiens that there weren't diminishing returns on software. How do we know that there were not diminishing returns on software? Because we can look at a graph of brain sizes and the graph is increasing linearly or like very recently like a little super linearly before it like sort of um, like hasn't changed all that much over the modern era because the modern era is relatively short. Okay, so we know that brain sizes got larger. How do we know that software was being improved by evolution at a steady pace without diminishing returns on individual mutations? So this is, um, again, something where if you're like interested, how do we actually know that? I would like send you over to this paper here. But why would a brain get the brain size is getting larger, uh, is it in relation to the, well, is, is it the ratio to the body size as well? It, or is it just the brain size? So I, I usually like think of it in terms of just the brain size. There's a tendency to consider these things in terms of body ratios, but I don't quite actually see, like in terms of returns on computation, like why, like shouldn't the returns be generated like by neurons doing work rather than by neurons during work divided by body size. So I do usually talk about like sort of absolute brain capacities. Um, I was just gonna say with a point four correlation with intelligence and another point six to explain. <coughs> I might not explain it. I'm just saying that could be, it doesn't necessarily have to be improvement in software for the increase in brain size necessarily. Um, if you're equating software with intelligence and intelligence is in, and software isn't perfectly correlated with brain size, then of course there's room in there for well, software definitely isn't correlated with brain size. What we know rather is that as software improves, the returns on brains improves. In other words, a brain that is running better software, you get more cognition per unit volume of brain. What is the meaning of better software if it doesn't give us improved cognition on, on like per unit brain, as it were. Like, what, when, why then call the software better? Um, actually, I think we had two pending questions. Is yours still? I'm sorry I'm not a biologist, but I'm just assuming that brain size-wise, are humans the ones with the biggest brains in the world? Don't I, d I, don't, I wouldn't expect so. I mean, like, I'd certainly expect uh, blue whales to have larger brains than us, unless I'm mistaken about that. So then how can the size of a brain be correlated to intelligence? It can't. We can say that the blue whales are probably running less efficient software than humans. They have like probably been subject to less selection for the most efficient software, and so they have larger brains, basically because they can afford them. They're like, they have these very huge bodies, right? So the brain is a relatively small portion of that body. So humans have these tremendously outsized brains relative to body size. The brain uses 20% of the ATP that is produced in the body. That's 20% of all the biological energy going into the brain. That's huge on a biological scale. It's a tremendous like investment sort of like by the genes, as it were. Um, there's still a real question though. Something like an elephant or a whale should be able to afford the human power brain very, very cheaply if you're a 200 ton blue whale. If intelligence is so great, why don't they have it? because they don't have the software. So again, like blue, so if a blue whale, like if the genes can divert like 0.001%, or actually maybe it's more like 0.01% of all the energy used by the body to sort of like steering the body more efficiently through the ocean, which is all the work they're getting out of the brain at that level of software. Only not really, because like presumably blue whales are having sex and presumably they're going to be competing for sex somehow, like generally when you find a species with a big brain, um, like what it's act, like the most complicated thing a species does under ordinary circumstances is compete for mates. But um, just comment on a couple of things here. Um, so blue whales do have um, a lot of complicated things they do, uh, mainly with songs. So they're really quite complicated patterns that they produce. But what do the songs do? Um, yeah, they're using them to compete for mates. Um, <laughs> 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 So, 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 
so, so, so tool use is like sort of not a very good, ex not a very plausible explanation for why human intelligence is as complicated as it is, because we're currently using tools that are way more complicated than the tools we were using when intelligence was being evolved. It also takes more intelligence to invent the tools than to actually use them, but most of the people who benefit from tools are the people using it rather than the people inventing it. Um, so like if we were, if we had the intelligence we do because it was like pushing toward the margins of being able to invent these tools, we have the question of like how were the few tool inventors as opposed to the many, many tool users able, able to gain enough of an evolutionary advantage to sustain the genes for tool invention. Um, as I understand, like as I understand the current state of evolutionary biology of hominid intelligence, the sort of dominant hypothesis is the way we got these tremendously outsized brains was that the complexity of sexual competition spiraled out of control. And there was sexual selection on brains. And um, generally when you have something that's sort of like using 20% of the resources, like a peacock's tail, sort of hugely elaborate things that are like sort of way more elaborate than you would expect from the species, there's a sexual selection story behind it. So I don't know how true it is nowadays, but at some point in over humanity's evolutionary history, brains were probably extremely sexy. So you know, usually traits like that are sexually dimorphic. Um, so why don't women have really pain brains that are really different? <laughs> and in, so, that is one reason why I said like sexual competition and not just sexual selection because women are also competing for mates fairly heavily. Or, or non-monogamous setting, but like either way. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the like sort of... Or software improved, but the um, sort of like benefit of the software improvements was used to shrink the brain rather than increase cognitive output. Because what I was about, like, the sort of like point I was eventually heading toward was that we saw brain sizes increase, but this tells us that um, it returns on brain size were increasing because the reason for brain size to increase is when the marginal returns on adding the next unit of brain power goes up. This is like a sort of fairly um, abstract economic argument here, but in like in a sort of evolutionary equilibrium, you should find that the returns on investment of all the organs are about equal because let's say that the returns on increasing brain sizes are much greater than the returns on spending the same biological resources on a larger heart or a faster heart. Then you should go with a little smaller heart and a little larger brain. Don't interpret that metaphorically or anything. So in equilibrium, we should find a sort of like marginal return balance um, between all the organs using a commensurable resource, such as ATP, the body, body's unit of metabolic currency. So what makes a brain increase in size is when the marginal returns on increasing the size of the brain increase due to better software. So there's some kind of software improvement, like better way to wire the cerebellum, better way to wire the cerebrum, better way to wire the prefrontal cortex, whatever, that increases the returns to increasing the size of the brain, and so the size of the brain increases. And then we like, don't necessarily stick in evolutionary equilibrium because the next software improvement could go along. But that's the sort of fundamental reason why the record of increasing brain sizes is a record of software improvements. So, if I understand uh, correctly, so do you think that when we decided, when, when people's brains got better in order to better 
understand things socially. That that same sets of machines that they improved for simulating other creatures' minds just happen to be also usable to do all kinds of other stuff. Like I, I, I don't know of any better story than that. I mean, the sort of the basic logic of evolution says that you need a sort of certain, like, sort of um, genes that provide very slight advantages. We can calculate their probability of rising to universality in the gene pool, and the um, it's like something along the lines of um, one over s, where s is the incremental advantage. So, if like a gene um, gives you a one percent. Um, no, wait, well, no, that can't be, no, sorry, it's not one over s, it's, no, it's, sorry, it's just two s. So if, if a gene has a 1% chance, increases your reproductive fitness by 1% relative to the people around you, then each time it's introduced into the population, it has around a 2% chance of rising to fixation. So if a gene presents a very small advantage to reproductive fitness on average, the probability that it will rise to fixation becomes equally small. What this means is that genes which rise to fixation are generally being used all the time by lots of people. If one out of 10,000 people is the person who first invents a spear, because after that, you know, like people just use the same spears their father used and so on, then what this says, besides the fact that there's some kind of moth or butterfly in here, is that the benefit that the gene provided to the inventor of the spear, you know, like might have gotten some status, some adulation from the people around them, but um, it only, since the gene is only useful one out of 10,000 times, its average benefit to fitness is very slight. So whatever the brain was doing in the ancestral environment, it had to be doing it all the time. Um, so stories about how the like chief use was like sort of inventing amazing new tools, like the people would have had to have been doing that all the time. And they kind of aren't in hunter-gatherer societies. Like when I visited the um, National Museum of, Aus of Australia in Canberra, I was like very struck by how they hadn't invented the bow and arrow. They had these like very beautiful, finely crafted, heavily optimized rock throwers, but they didn't have the bow and arrow. I don't think that invention was a very routine activity back was a very routine activity back then. So it can't be account so it's sort of like natural to look at like we like think of the power of intelligence as being in our tools. We have all these awesome tools, like projectors. Look at how evolutionary useful this thing is. And it's sort of natural to look at human beings with like the tanks, the swords, and the guns and say, like, ah, the intelligence must be there to make the tools. But in the hunter-gatherer societies where the
but also your answer to the comment about um, the decreasing ranks of humans seems to imply that the decreasing size of the brain is also consistent with increasing soft tissue. Um, increasing brain size can <coughs> mean that the efficiency of the brain has decreased and so you need a larger brain to do the same work. Or it can mean that the software of the brain has improved, and so like you could get <coughs> returns on a larger brain, or the marginal returns of a larger brain size once more equilibrated with the rest of the body. Um, however, under the circumstances, it um, seems like a pretty good guess that the efficiency was going up rather than down. Um, what, what can have been happening is that the sort of efficiency stayed the same. Um, like, or, or the efficiency could have stayed the same and there could have been like a greater demand for cognition, um, which is why it's like sort of hard to handle this kind of thing. But um, basically, when an organ gets larger, you think the marginal returns in it are going up. The marginal returns on the thing going up can happen because you just suddenly sliced half of it away, and so you've only got half as much left. And like by diminishing returns, if you take away a lot of the thing, what's left will then have increased marginal returns when you add the next unit to it. Like if you lost half of your money, a dollar half your money, a dollar would be more valuable to you. Um, but that's not why the brain size went out of equilibrium. The, like, there was, it's not the case that the reason why human brain sizes were going up in the fossil record was that they had suddenly halved in size a generation before that. So we know that it's not because they lost half their money that money was more valuable. It's got to be the returns that were going up. Um, it's sort of like the, the broad answer there. Um, today we see that brain sizes have diminished somewhat from the hunter-gatherer days. It could be that there's less demand for a cognition. Or it could be that you only needed that there's been a constant demand for a cognition, um, increasing efficiency, and have hence diminished marginal returns in the next unit of the brain because the stuff you have already is doing enough work that you can afford to like fire some neurons and make do with what's left. Because they're more efficient. Right. So it does seem like the first hypothesis is a lot more plausible. And the whole thing, uh, the idea that we need less cognition. Um, so, you know, since the cultural revolution, the whole uh, purpose of civilization is that we've been progressing slowly and that you can pass on this progression from generation to generation. So you build on each um, invention humanity has made to make the next one. Um, you, once you've been born into that in society, that's where you've invented all these things, you can just go about using them. You can very quickly learn them. You don't need to go through the process of reinventing everything that's already been discovered. Um, that's also true of hunter gatherers. They like used a certain number of things. Um, they didn't generally didn't need them back then. They like relatively few people, little spent, relatively just fewer of their days reinventing things. Um, and it's like more stuff to use now. Um, it could be that farmers led less complicated lives than hunter gatherers. I think that the people in, in this room are probably leading like significantly more complicated terms of the lives than hunter gatherers in terms of amount of culture they have to observe to make it through the day. Um, but during these sort of like long subsistence farming eras, it could be that there was less demand for cognition because you weren't moving around as much. And perhaps it didn't need to be so instantaneous. When you're hunting gather and you're faced with life and death situations that, are, that rely on very quick decisions, maybe that higher processing power is actually necessary. But when you're looking at seasons as a farmer does. Or religion increased the complexity of the mating game by like imposing a particular set of rules. So one thing we probably should separate right now is that uh, thinking that brain size and dealing with complexity is related because if you're still working with the analogy of computers and brain, uh, then computers were large and fun a few decades ago and then they shrunk in size and then the software improved and that software improved helped them make them even smaller. So um, the size of the brain is not necessarily an indicator of the complexity of a uh, uh, thinking machine is dealing with. I, I agree that like sort of the absolute size of brains in general is not a good 
In the case of humans, we can compare the hardware that we're running directly to the hardware of chimpanzees because the chimpanzees are still around. Um, as far as I, I think that there is one type of neuron. I'm trying to think if like humans and chimpanzees have this type of neuron, and other primates don't, or if it's humans who have it and chimpanzees don't. <coughs> but like over the last million, five million years at least, I think there's been at most one new kind of neuron invented, and it's in the prefrontal cortex. Not very surprising. Um, so in the case of modern computers, um, there the cost per unit of computation dropped tremendously, which meant that we bought a lot more computation. It also happens to have been miniaturized. But the like fundamental reason why this computer is more powerful than the computers of years and years ago is that it's got software that increases the return per unit of computation, and the computation is much cheaper. But we don't actually use computers that are about as powerful as the computers from 20 years ago, because we continue to get returns from the new software you could write once you had more computing power. So I would claim that like this is a, a situation you can analyze in terms of marginal returns. In fact, there's very few economic situations that you do not analyze in terms of marginal returns. Um, someone else had a question? And just that rather surprised by the functionalism of the argument, it seems like the argument of that if there's a need or if there's an opportunity, you know, take it. And all the rejects like that. Are there some constraints, perhaps? I mean, so the diet, for example, I mean, we're talking about agriculture, the market calorie intake went down very dramatically during the small alteration set of the sustenance farmers. Couldn't that be like a much more likely explanation yeah. mm -hmm. of the huge rates? Yeah. Um, because then it was more expensive to run grains. Uh, because then you couldn't grow grains. You require energy to grow. Well, if the, if the genes were there, um, if the genes were constant, then they should have just sort of like come back to the agriculture, unless agriculture persisted for long enough for the genes for larger grains to decay. But um, I, I, I mean, I think the argument you're describing basically works, um, and just need like some minor adjustments, but those are not minor things. Okay, so I am a tree, or I see the tree. Um, I, I, I have genetic potential to grow to be extremely huge, which means I will get more sunlight now and then. Uh, then, however, the soil does not support me more than the so I never get to that side. Like, why does yeah. evolution advantage? Where, where does that even come in? If I so, 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 so basically, that condition needs to persist for long enough for random mutations to degrade the genes that would otherwise be responsible for growing to large sizes. If it only happens for one generation, I can take you out, pot you into the soil, and you'll once again grow huge. If you see what I'm saying. Like, your offspring will once again, your seeds will once again grow huge the next generation. Like, unless that persists for long enough for the genes supporting large size to be randomized. Um, arguably, agriculture might have done this. Um, there, uh, there was a very recent discovery that shocked me. I was floored. Um, and it says that, like, over the agricultural era, the rate of genetic change in humans has, like, sped up by about a factor of 100. Meaning that the agricultural era was, like, an evolutionarily significant amount of time. Yes. People are making shocked faces. That's the same face I um, made when I heard the news. And I'm like, sort of still half expecting that later I'll read another press release saying that there was something horribly wrong with the like, calculations and molecular geneticists, and that's not actually true. But I mean, we, we did get tossed into an like, extremely different environment. It's like not totally implausible that, in, that genetic change was, just happened to not be all that fast before then, because we were like, almost an evolution of living and we got kicked way out of evolution.
presumably the Einstein is smart. <laughs> and every time people look around to see how the science of artificial intelligence is progressing, they find that AIs are still dumber than real tickets. And it's been that way for the last 60 years, and maybe it'll just like stay that way for another 500 years. But I think that like what's actually going on is that the real scale of intelligence, like the Nadir is not village, it's a rock. Then like slowly AI is moving up past the level of the lizard, past the level of, like we are still, I think we're actually like, past the at this point, we can like drive cars and do other some other impressive things. Then we go past mouse, and then like village and Einstein are this like sort of very relatively narrow range. So like running the same basic software. If you look at the brain of the village, the brain of Einstein, it's like all the same parts, it's like all the same engines. There's actually a fundamental reason for that, again, in terms of evolutionary biology. Um, like imagine that a bit of complex machinery, there's like 10 genes that code for it, so like 10 genes in regulatory areas that code for it. If only half the population has this particular gear with 10 parts, then in the next generation, will like sort of scramble those ten genes, and each person will like sort of add, add, end up with an average of five genes, and it's like very unlikely to get all the genes together in one place again. So what this says that is that complex machinery, the complex, including the complex machinery of the brain, is going to be mostly universal in a sexually reproducing population, but there's going to be some like little changes that don't depend very much on other changes yet, that are being selected on any <coughs> course in time. Some of those changes then rise to universality, and then you can get other changes that are dependent on the first changes being selected on. And eventually you get what looks like super duper complex interdependent machinery with like thousands of parts, thousands of genes. But at any given point of time, if you have a prefrontal cortex, you, are, you do not get to be a mutant who like, has a prefrontal cortex and no one else has a prefrontal cortex. At best, you can like, be a mutant who has a prefrontal cortex that's 1% larger or has like 10% more of a particular kind of neuron or something like that. But you can't evolve complex machinery in one mutation. And that's why the sort of like underlying reasoning, even beyond opening up the brains and looking, that we think that the village of Adrian Einstein have been running basically more or less the same software. It's a justification for putting them this close on the graph. They were part of a sexually reproducing species. Einstein can't have been a super mutant um, who has like a complex machinery, the entire complex machinery that the village of is missing, because genes only mutate one at a time. They don't like mutate in these big coordinated groups. So when you zoom out and look at like sort of the promise of that, it's going to look like that. Like the time from when AI is dumber than a village idiot to smarter than Einstein is probably not going to be all that long of time because the village idiot and Einstein are like much closer together than we would sort of like might believe might, might just by our own. So that's the sort of intelligence explosion thesis. That the process whereby Earth unfolds into an intergalactic future is not gradual and smooth. It bottlenecks through the invention of machines much smarter than us, which in turn is a process where we have some reason to believe that um, the returns on cognitive improvements are large enough that it looks sudden. We have the, um, the argument from we know that we can have computers that run much faster than the brain. There's the argument from um, this is what the curve of hominid evolution looked like with sort of fairly constant evolutionary pressure to improve things. If you then have a self-improving device that the pressure it's putting it on itself is not constant, it should look flat while it's not powerful enough to improve itself significantly. And once it is powerful enough to improve itself significantly, it'll go like, like that. <coughs> and um, there 
as the sort of argument from just sort of the subjectively, it seems like, um, like we're zooming in too much on the uh, sort of how intelligence looks to humans part, and so AI is going to sort of seem intuitively like it's done with an ability for a while, and it's going to cover the relatively small ground, not going to pose to very many complex changes from ability to humans by the course of a season in a relatively short time. And so this is the sort of sudden food market. Um, I see that we are now having some people who wish to go for just one hour since I began. Now, there were like other things within this talk, and I didn't really get to cover from the AI, but I think none of us wise to sort of like stop the q and here and like have a second talk, basically, if people still want a second talk. Um, questions? Like sort of general Q&A, like including about Harry Potter and the methods of rationality. <laughs> <laughs> like, so let's just call this like talk line. I can give a talk to if there's demand, but otherwise this is all like talk line. So I am like, I feel way more confident that at some point there will be an intelligence explosion than we knew about the timing. The arguments for intelligence explosion are sort of like basic arguments about what happens with the observed curve of returns on types of cognitive improvements if you can get the AI to front or start self-improving. Um, you can like sort of nail it down in the fossil record, you can um, like nail it down by sort of like figuring out the upper bounds and hardware and hardware. When? That's like a much harder question. The way I sometimes describe it is that even if I knew exactly how to build an AI and I knew who I had available to build that AI, and I knew how much funding I had to build that AI, I still wouldn't be able to give you a precise date because it's a lot of work and there's some sort of like general gods of project perhaps with friend of mine. Um, so since I don't know any of these things, how on earth can I predict like when AI will be? Um, it seems like there's multiple factors, like like sort of multiple unknown variables in terms of it, like that would affect when you could build AI, like sort of like how much progress the general field of machine learning makes, how hard the problem is, where the threshold of recursive self-improvement is, and like uncertainty about any one of those things would smear our probability mass out very wide, even if we were sure of all the others. So um, like sort of as a judgment of probability, it seems appropriate to me for this like timing question to answer, not only do I not know, but I have some cause to believe that you don't know either. Which is like a much stronger statement that I don't know, which would be with certain very special occasions. Um, just looking at the lizard mouse to enter the Einstein picture, currently just going from how we use other life forms and how we sort of exercise our human, our human intelligence to conduct experiments on them or whatever, use, use them for our own purposes, it only seems logical that once AI exceeds us, it should be able to utilize us for those same things. And so what is the human obligation to give up our place in the macro and center of the universe when AI exceeds us? Okay. That's the second half of the talk. <laughs> That's the second talk. Um, I will like to advance um, sort of one step further and say, like, by the previous argument from um, like the Ernest Sackett only reproducing population, therefore we share all the complex machines, except for uh, typical cases of brain damage that can like, remove some complex machines that none of us have, like whole complex machines that no one else has. Even by this like very tiny dot within the space of minds in general. And when people say artificial intelligence, they might like try to think of some kind of particular foreign tribe that sort of looks metallic. But really, artificial intelligence is just the entire space of possible mind science. And sort of for any given quality you name, um, there are things in here that have that quality and there are things in there that don't have that quality. Um, can I actually, you know, I think I'm just sort of like going to just launch into the like, second part of the talk because there's no other way to answer that question, sort of like launching into the entire thing. Um, but I have some like priority questions first. Um, yeah, I have. Uh, I did read. Oh, okay. uh, so uh, I have a, a question sort of uh, for that uh, 
first thesis. Uh, so, so that is basically, uh, isn't a conclusion from it basically that we should uh, put all of our resources into uh, researching uh, uh, artificial intelligence to progress into this state where uh, most of the well-being will be rather than concentrate on or in, on improving well-being within our uh, uh, society, for instance? Well, if it takes 50 years to invent AI, then like, the lights have to be kept on during that time. I would actually make a marginal resources argument. There's some, like, there's some level of resources that are be sensible to invest in that, which isn't even close to like sort of 1% of the planetary GDP, because we cannot effectively invest 1% of the planetary GDP in this, even if it's the like, sort of relatively much more important part. Um, to like like 
this is supposed to be like if you imagine like measuring flying ability among pigeons and saying that 15 points of fly Q was one standard deviation of flying ability among pigeons, then this is not going to get you much closer to developing the concept of aerodynamic lift, which is what you need to design your own airplane. Like you're not going to have very much luck necessarily by studying the fly Q of pigeons as it becomes what you need as a concept of aerodynamic lift. So this over here is, and at the same time, like pigeons that have stronger wings are probably going to get some fly Q boost up. So this over here is sort of like trying to measure um, some sort of generalized sense of cognitive horsepower. And the difficulty with that is that right up until like this level around here, um, creatures specialize. Spiders weave webs, beavers build dams, bees build, bees build hives. It's just the humans who can look at the bee building the hive and the beaver building the dam and envision a like honeycomb shaped dam or something like that. So, but we have this not general intelligence. If we truly had general intelligence, some of us would have figured out how to program computers by now. What we have might be called significantly more generally applicable than chimpanzees and and because of that sort of adaptivity, like among ourselves, there can be such a thing as an IQ scale. Because we have intelligence that generalizes well across domains. And yet it still seems like there are important senses in which a mouse is smarter than a lizard, which is smarter than a spider. Like larger brains, better designed brains, more adaptive brains. Mice can do things that lizards can. Lizards can do things that spiders can. Mice also have a bunch of extra parts in their brains compared to lizards, and it seems likely that those parts are doing something. So, to answer your question, like, yes, this scale is bogus because it purports to measure, like, sort of some kind of general thing among, and, like, and there are points in it for creatures who are actually very specialized. Um, but, at the same time, like, it totally looks that way. And that would sort of be my attempt at answer. Ah, yes, okay. So, I've heard the argument made that requests for donations to AI and specifically friendly AI research is reasonably comparable to a Pascal's mugger, in that you're asking for money for a small chance of something very, very good happening. I would never ask for money for a small chance of something very, very good happening. Asking for money for a medium chance of something very, very good happening. There's a very, very big difference because this is this is like ancient Earth, right? All the future value of the galaxies is like sort of flowing through here possibly. If all you can do is identify a tiny chance of affecting it, somewhere there is a medium chance of affecting it. Somewhere there is something you can do that is more useful. If you think there's an only a tiny chance of artificial intelligence being relevant, biotech. What if we wipe ourselves out by a biotech? Uh, what if we like sort of wipe, wipe ourselves out by um, using like sort of natural human antibiotics as uh, sort of like commercially available antibiotics and develop superbugs with resistance to sort of natural human antibiotics, in which case wound stop them. That was something that gave me a bit of pause when I read about it, mm -hmm. uh, especially since the rest of the antibiotic pipeline seems to be broken. Um, molecular nanotechnology. Like what I think happens with molecular nanotechnology is that you get super fast computers, someone uses them to reinforce the one kind of AI in the world ends. But if you didn't think that was going to happen with molecular nanotechnology, it's an awful lot of power being able to like put molecules where you want them and build machines that can build copies of themselves on an infinite supply of perfectly machined spare parts, which is what happens when you're designed to run a molecular level. The world is full of an infinite supply of perfectly machined spare parts. Um, I literally have no idea how molecular nanotechnology would play out without AI or how it would play out well, but it would be important. It would be like one of the bottlenecks that the future of the galaxies have to pass through. There's a lot of stuff going on. If AI wasn't the most important stuff, something else would be the most important stuff. So tiny probabilities of large payoffs, not going to fly. There's other things out there with, with plausible things to be medium-sized probabilities of making a very large difference. 
So that argument is fallacious. I never made it. I'm actually the person who coined the term Pascal's money to describe the fallacy of asking for, uh, of like trying to have your strategies revolve around very tiny probabilities of very large payoffs. I don't know how it keeps getting repeated that like this is something that we're endorsing because I'm kind of the person who named the fallacy that they used to describe the kind of fallacy and I don't know so that kind of laid out in like great early detail the blog post and later the sort of like fundamental epistemological innovation that justifies not in Pascal's mouth, but whatever. <laughs> So how do you think that, uh, so right now, say you had to go uh, design AI that would be intelligent. How do you go about doing it? How do I go about designing AI that's intelligent? Yeah. If I knew that in sufficiently concrete detail, I would not be standing here talking. <laughs> <laughs> At least if I knew the correct, like, the other parts of the problem, so that, that was actually a good thing rather than a bad thing. Um, I mean, if you like, want to study it, um, the most commonly used artificial intelligence textbook and I speak from, from here as someone who is like sort of perfectly willing to call, call entire fields on having like mainstream stupid beliefs as they happen to. But the most common art textbook in artificial intelligence is actually pretty good. I mentioned it. Uh, but this has not affected my opinion of it in any way. And it's called Artificial Intelligence Modern Approach. Um, hopefully there's like some AI based, basic AI course we have around here that's, that's using it. Actually, quite good. If you go through this course and you like have like enough math and programming ability to keep up, you will learn a great deal more about intelligence than you, than you know right now. There is no simple answer. There's like no kind of fits on a T-shirt slogan that can give you broad level intelligence. If that were, were that easy, it would have been done by now, and everyone would be dead. So, so artificial intelligence so false approach. Artificial intelligence and modern approach. Who the author? Peter Norvig. So you're betting on software rather than a massive um, kind of virtualized mode network? So the thing is, is that a lot of our algorithms just don't have very great marginal returns on adding more and more hardware to them. Um, like we're getting better at that as time goes on, and it could be that the end of the world will come about um, when someone at Google has an AI pro pro uh, program that seemed moderately promising on like 10 computers and then they like ask Larry Page for permission to run their awesome AI algorithm on like all million computers or however many computers, like however, like however large of a supercomputing cluster Google has at that time. Um, but I wouldn't really bet on it because um, a, like the current AI algorithms we have tend to have diminishing returns so severe beyond the sort of like first run that running them on a supercomputer is not really going to help very much. Um, they sort of like run out of things to learn. They, they run out of hypotheses to explore. They're like sort of working in a conceptually small space but that like a, a space conceptually small enough that they don't scale. Um, if that changes in the future, then it could be that um, sort of like effective AI will scale and will start go over the recursive self-improvement threshold when it's like run out of using a hardware machine. I don't want to rule out that possibility. But it's not really how things look at the moment, as it were. Our software would have to advance before we could get to that point. I know you, you have raised your hand. You yeah. <laughs> so I was wondering if I have a topic. So over the years, when uh, uh, we, we have been researching for um, what I should tell you. What are the kind of main points in which you change your mind at some point? Okay. So, like when I was young and, and foolish, um, I sort of thought that um, AIs were automatically moral basically because of not quite understanding the views his ought to divide um, and being sort of uh, like the wrong kind of moral realist, the one who thinks that there's ontologically based moral truth. Um, so I kind of grew out of that, and that was when I realized that if you wanted an AI that was going to transform the galaxies into things that were worthwhile, like you actually had to conserve a bunch of design power in order to pick out the like, sort of relatively small point in design space for an AI that would actually do that. Um, so that was like by far the largest update. Um, 
there's sort of like a, a not entirely unrelated update where I realized that all of the theories of intelligence I had been publishing up until 2003 were like useless English words and it was time to like become a Bayesian and like uh, get to grips with uh, sort of like more abstract and mappy views of these things. Uh, there's no sort of like obvious major updates over time. Uh, do you have a different one in mind? Um, yes, I was. My question relates to the earlier question about your definition of intelligence, and I'm just thinking back to the model that you laid out. We have the lizard is um, brain is less advanced than the mouse, etc. And yeah, exactly. And in each of those instances, you talked about the development of the human brain in an interpersonal context, specifically, right? And positive that. Um, the evolutionary advantage of having a having an increasingly more efficient brain, but also underlying that was this interpersonal context, the need to mate, the need to find a mate. And so my question is, each of the the, the brain advancement of each of these uh, entities, lizard, mouse, human, is appropriate to its interpersonal context, right? And so not necessarily. I okay. mean, humans do a lot more interpersonal stuff on a daily basis than lizards. Okay. So, like, lizard brains are, are probably not mostly interpersonal. That's one reason why they're small. Okay. They don't have to be interpersonal. But it also has to mate, right? So, mating is an interpersonal activity, and you yourself said that mating is one of the most important activities that a brain controls, right? Um, among humans. So, like, lizards also have to mate, but mating for them is less complicated. It has to be because their brains are small, and their brains are small because it's less well, exactly. And so that's what I mean when I say that the, the brain size fits the interpersonal context, right? So the lizard brain is small because the mating process is less complex. And so what I'm trying to say is th th there's, a, there's a purpose for the brain, for the brain size. And there's so, an evolutionary reason. Right. And, I've, and one of the characteristics in human intelligence has tended to be the questioning of, of its own purpose, right? So do you anticipate a, a point in artificial intelligence where... AI questions the reason for continuing to reinvest in its own program. Um, that's that was like definitely a like part two of talk. Then. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know like whether or how late you're planning to stay. Uh, I can try to give like a sort of very brief account of. Um, so suppose you have a set of preferences. Goal, a utility function. Um, and the sort of simplest way you might imagine a naturally rational agent um, working, um, it chooses between, it's a consequentialist, it chooses between actions on the basis of selecting from among their consequences. Um, in particular, um, there are some fairly fundamental theorems called the Newman. Uh, on Newton Morgan's term theorems, which show that you either have to interpret your actions as assigning utilities to outcomes, and you find those utilities by probabilities to arrive at an expected utility, or your preferences are in some sense circular. You like fly from Oxford to, well, from London to San Francisco to Tokyo, and then to, to um, London again, because you prefer being, you'd rather be in San Francisco than London, you'd rather be in Tokyo than San Francisco, and you'd rather be in London than in Tokyo, which if these situations combined will cause you to spend quite a lot of money on plane tickets. So we can sort of axiomatically rule out those situations with reflect again expect utility maximization. So let's say that you're Mohan Gandhi. You don't like murders. People getting murdered by other people is bad. They're like probably pro death because I'm black, but you're anti, very anti murder. So now I offer you a pill that will make you want to, to murder people. Do you take the pill? No, because if you take the pill and you know what the pill does, so if you know what the pill does, and you realize that if you take this pill, you're going to murder people, and then murders will occur, and that's bad. Um, symmetrically, if you're in mind that chooses between actions on the basis of which, which action leads to the most paper clips, if you are a paperclip maximizer, then the um, then modifying your utility function to do something other than count paperclips 
is not going to lead to there being more paper clips. Now, why don't you guys think about this? My sort of basic answer there would be that humans evolved in natural selection, which is a very unnatural way for a mind to come into existence. I fully expect that most of the minds that will ever exist will not be evolved minds. They will be intelligently designed minds. They look very different. But if you are an evolved mind, what you end up with is a lot of sort of conflicting drives and positive and negative reinforcers. Um, you like things that taste sugary because sugar was a rare resource in the ancestral environment. Like most people were not getting enough sugar most of the time. So you gravitate towards sugar, you gravitate towards rather like most people were not getting enough things that happened to be sugary. Maybe it's that maybe they needed the vitamin C in fruits and fruit fruits taste the sugar. So in modern times you have aspiring for things like ice cream. That's probably the case that most of us are not eating too little ice cream. But the logic of your builder does not update fast enough to realize that your body doesn't need more ice cream. It goes on being attracted to whatever would have increased fitness in the ancestral environment and not would increase his fitness today. Well, in some human environments today, ice cream is still pretty advantageous. I mean, in Oxford, in the UK, it's not. Yeah, like, individual organisms are best thought of as adaptation executors around the fitness maximizers. And so, so the, the, to the answer to the question, do you anticipate AI being able to question its own utility and its own reinvesting process? So, the, so like, with enough care, we could build an AI that did that, but most AIs with random utility functions are probably not going to exhibit that behavior. Okay. Even you exhibit that behavior in a sense. Like, suppose I could give you a pill that made you you'd want nothing but to maximize paper clips. You'd be like, oh no, now I can no longer question my goals in the way that I think it is right and proper for me to question them. Mm -hmm. So, like, even when you question your own goals, you're like still performing a particular style of computation. You're still asking a particular kind of question. The kind of question that you ask when you question your own goals then becomes the thing that is that you want to be stable. You don't want to take a pill that disrupts the questioning process. It's sort of it's like we could simplify considerably and say that you're sort of like that you, you, there's the a hopefully well formed, though in actuality of course not well formed because we're humans and humans are giant messes, which is what I was getting at the like doesn't conflict and drives adaptation entities thing. But which drives you balance, how you balance them, the philosophies and ideals you espouse while doing that, that's your kind of moral frame of reference. And you wouldn't take a pill that made you leave that moral frame of reference and pursue only paper clips. And the moral frame of reference is complex enough that it's a small point in the space. And if something that maximizes paper clips doesn't question its desire to maximize paper clips and jump asking the sort of particular very complicated moral questions that human, humans ask any more than humans think it desirable to just jump out of that whole system of moral agonizing and just do paper. Another point, I would give one last clap to Elisabeth Kowski. <laughs>